Hello, my friends. Joe Wolverton, the Teacher of Liberty. I'm back with you again. Man, how do y'all stand it? I, you know, I'm going I'm to be honest with you. And this is the honest truth. I'm going to pull the curtain back from the wizard. Like, when kids, when I would teach in a classroom in a brick-and-mortar building, and, you know, students would say how much they liked my class... I honestly, some of them, and some of them that might watch this podcast can can vouch for this, I would be like, why? I would be bored out of my skull listening to this old man, blah, 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 funny stories, blah, blah, history, blah, blah, virtue. But I don't know. So I get tired of myself. So if y'all get tired of me, don't like, how do you unsubscribe? Don't do that. Don't, don't, don't hurt your, don't hurt your boy. Don't do that to Joey. Just just don't watch me. But don't get bored because these things really are important. I say that I would get bored with myself. It's just because I know me. But even I, I'm like I said last time, I get so fired up doing these podcasts. So let's get into this. Let's get it. Let's go. And I want to tell you today about, okay, we're going to move. I'm going to zig when you want me to zag. Because I'm going to tell you some stories today that come from the history of ancient China. Now, I am not Chinese. I am no speaker of any Chinese dialect. So if I get these names wrong and you out there are Chinese or you speak Chinese, send me a comment and say, Joey, you pronounce it and then spell it out phonetically And I will be like, from then on, I will pronounce it correctly. But today, I am going to ask for your grace. Please be kind to your very Anglo host, Joey, c'est moi. Um, But I bet none of you thought, I'm going to flip on Joey today. I'm going to dial him up, put it on whatever channel Joey comes on, I'm going to watch my man tell me a story from history, and I guarantee you none of you thought, he's going to talk about China. So let's talk about China. Now we're talking ancient China, you know, 1300 BC, 1500 BC, around then. Now, where did Joey learn about this? Joey learned about this, like I always do, trying to drink right from the source, no downstream drinking for Joey. Sima Qian. Yes, I know that's not how you pronounce it, because I have a one of my cousins, her husband, is like a Chinese, uh, like he he's all about, I think he's a professor of Chinese, he's a white guy, but he's like a professor of Chinese or something. So I remember he told me one time how to pronounce that correctly, but now I've forgotten. So Sima Qian, he was the grand historian and he kept the historical records. And so these stories that I'm telling you today come from there. And there are other versions of the story, just like if... And this is how I explain this. You and your neighbor, both of y'all, let's say, keep a journal. And in the journal, you write the things that happen, you know, in your neighborhood. Those two journals are not going to tell the same story. So the reason I tell you that is I'm reading, this is where, you know, I read Sima Kyung. He's the most uh, reputable, the most respected, the most often quoted historian of ancient China. But you might go on the Google machine and be like, bleep, bloop, bleep. Joey, it says that he did this. It might. Okay? And here's something. That's not the most important thing if there are various stories. The stories I'm telling you are true as far as we know them to be true. Okay? And I read them in English. Not the language that C. McKeon wrote them in. I can't read that language. My point is, you can trust that I'm telling you the truth insofar as the truth is known. If 25 years from now we find out that Sima Kian was just trolling us all, that's not on me. Okay, that's on Sima. We can all gang up on him when we see him in the afterlife. We can be like, Sima, what's that all about? We got a bone to pick with you, sir. All right. Talk about 1300 BC, China. Okay. Now, 
<laughs> this all okay. They were ruled by the Shang dynasty. The name of the king at the time was Tang. So his name was King Tang Shang. <laughs> King. Mm -mm. Don't, don't, don't make King. <clears throat> King Tang Sheng. Okay, King Tang Sheng. He was out in his kingdom, uh, traveling about, just observing things as he would, being the king. And he noticed that in this one area, all of the irrigation seemed so well planned and so well executed, whereas in most other parts of his realm, it just seemed like people kind of let the water run where the water run, maybe divert it a little bit, but in this section of his kingdom, whoever did this was brilliant. So King Tang Shang gets out of his carriage. It goes over. And he's always asking asking around the village, hey, who is responsible for this? Because this is amazing. And I wanna I wanna talk to the you know guy who came up with this because it made you know, it, more bountiful harvests. It made everything look more orderly. It was a wiser stewardship of a resource that, you know, like water, everything. And it just did the, the diversion, everything perfectly planned and executed, right? And you know, that's the deal, right? Planning something swell, carrying out the plan, that is to say, executing the plan, that's not, that's something fewer people can do. Lots of people can come up, come up with good plans, but I, when I was nine, I came up with plans for a flying motorcycle. I, I, there is no flying motorcycle. So obviously I'm a guy who can make plans. No, I'm just, so King Tang Shang, King, I'm just going to call him Tang, Tang. King Tang, sorry, King Tang. King Tang was like, all right, introduce me to the mastermind behind this irrigation project. He comes to meet a guy named Yi Yin. Yi Yin, simple farmer, but obviously a genius. He is the man who, who theorized, who conceptualized, who designed, dug, <laughs> and watched over the irrigation system in that province. And the king could not heap greater praises on Yi Yin. In fact, so impressed was the king, not only with Yi Yin's obvious ingenuity and resourcefulness, but with his respect, with the way that he approached his humility, the way that he responded to the king. So the king invited him to come live at the palace and be one of his advisors, one of his counselors. Well, I, this is where, okay, that's why I have a podcast so I don't have to go quickly. I'm, okay, Yi Yin. Why do you think he was able to do that? I mean, I'm, I know y'all can't respond like right away, like I wish we could. But why do you think, why was Yi Yin able? What, what, what is there that gave bent and force to his mind that enabled him to not only conceive of, but carry, you know, carry out such intricate, and and expert 
irrigation. What was it about him? Right? Why did so many other provinces essentially look like, you know, they were irrigated by accident? Whereas when you went to the province that was the home of Yi Yin, it looked as if some very scientific, very patient, very aware mind, very observant mind, had concocted all of this. It looked so well-ordered, you know? Now, the king, I'm sure, and beyond doubt, was seeking to reward Yi Yin for his diligence, for his persistence, for his ingenuity, right? All as evidenced by the irrigation system that he devised. But I am sure that if we were able to ask the king, you know, what impressed you so much, he would just say that, well, look at what this guy's done in his province Okay, well, why are you inviting him back to the palace to be a, an advisor, a counselor to you? Well, I want, this is the kind of person I want advising me. Someone who can make such plans. Someone who can execute those plans. Someone who can watch over those plans, make sure they're functioning as he designed them. I'm positive that that was what the king would say. And I'm positive, as are you, that Yi Yin would be so excited. Come to the palace. So where's your house, Yi Yin? My what now? Your house? Um, yeah, come on over. You can imagine. Right? There was going to be quite the culture shock moving from his farmhouse, his house out in the province, to the capital, to the king's palace. It would be very few people who could resist that, yeah? But the thing that always left me going, hmm. What was it about Yi Yin that particularly enabled him to create such a system in his province that was above and beyond, head and shoulders above the other systems? in the sister provinces. What was it about him? Now you see, the king is like, he's a genius. I don't know if he was. And this is where so much of this story, I think, is, you know, how they say history turns very, very small hinges? I think this is one of those hinges that history turned on and turned in a way that, first of all, you probably won't expect. And second of all, that I don't, I don't particularly think Yi Yin expected. And certainly not the king. So, but remember, he, his whole life living, living on the farm and designing these, you know, working to, just use the rain, use the water to his advantage, to the advantage of his neighbors. I mean, this is a guy who, it just didn't help him. It helped all of his neighbors as well. They all, you know, it was the, uh, the tide that lifted all boats, so to speak. That's, that's the type of guy, I mean, you can understand the king, right? 
You can understand the king be like, that's the guy I want around me, of course. We are. Who wouldn't? But the essential problem is this. The king saw Yi Yin through an entirely different lens than Yi Yin saw himself. Had Yi Yin grown up and worked at the palace, would his ingenuity, his resourcefulness, would that have had opportunity to flourish? To flourish to the degree that caught the attention of the king? Or what I think is his talent was made apparent by the fact that he was a farmer. And his desire to dig those ditches and reroute the water to the benefit of all is because he was a farmer. Because it's like our founding fathers universally. People like to say, oh, they disagreed on stuff. Sure, of course. Of course they disagreed on some things. But they all agreed on, on this, that farmers were the people most capable of self-government and they were the closest to God and they were the most virtuous. And Thomas Jefferson explained that it is because of their absolute and annual consistent, faithful reliance on God to send the rain. And that need of God's assistance in your enterprise connects you to Him in a way that the rest of us only wish we were connected to him. Because guys, guess what Yi Yin knew? And what every farmer knows? I can have the best seeds. I can have the best science behind my planting. Distance between rows, distance between the plantings. The seeds that are of the, of the highest quality I can have soil that is so fertile. I can be I I could be in a place where anything grows. I can watch and care for my crops. I can tend to them, weed them, dig about them. The whole I can be the absolute textbook, perfect, exemplary farmer. But if God doesn't send that rain, nothing that I did matters. If there's a drought, the clever farmer dies the same as the others. So farmers, gosh, why my people ever left the farm, I'll never know. Making me go back to it. What the heck, y'all? You could have just stayed there. But Yi Yin, I really am convinced that his genius was not just some sort of general, overall genius. I think it was because he was a farmer and he did something so, was able to do something so extraordinary because it was so necessary. To him it was doing something ordinary 
in an extraordinary way. But to the king, it was like, whoa, Yi Yin, dude, how did you, come on, let's hop in, we're going to the palace. Okay, Yi Yin goes to the palace. He is still alive and still there when Tang dies 30 years later. Now, as kings are wont to do, King Tang Sheng named his oldest son, was his successor. He suspiciously died before he could be crowned. Number two son's like, hey, heir and a spare, baby, I'm on. I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille. Where, where's my cool hat? Suspiciously died. Third son. They had to wake that, you know they had to wake that dude up. Hey, man. Hmm. You're king. Dude, put your glasses on. I'm, I'm son number three, man. I'm not king. No, you're king. You know how, you know how your older brother, something happened? Yeah. You know the one right above you? Something just happened to him too. All right, then wear my hat. All right, so he gets, he gets his hat. He actually reigns on, sits on the throne, reigns for four years. And then mysterious death. Now. Yi Yin killed all of those young men. Yi Yin was worried now, in the wake of his murders, that despite his reputation for being honorable and wise and good and decent and generous, of spirit that people might start to suspect that this is a guy with extraordinary access. Maybe we take a look, you know, into his closet and see if he doesn't, you know, if we can't find some skeletons, like literal skeletons. So he, he doesn't, he, he doesn't kill the next one in line. King had lots of sons, let me tell you. But what he does is he's just a kid. So Yi Yin names himself Regent. Now, for those of you who don't know, Regent, very simply defined, someone who rules in the stead of the king Due to some incapacitation of the king, usually the king's minority status, meaning he was too young to rule as a king. Okay? So Yi Yin is the regent, essentially the king, but not really. And the little boy grows up. He is old enough to want to take the throne that's rightfully his. Do you think Yi Yin was like, oh, great, you're grown up here, buddy. Here, sit here. I'm going to go back to my farm. See ya. No. As soon as that kid started resisting and started trying to, you know, exercise his, you know, inherited authority... As soon as he tried to have his prerogatives acknowledged over those of his father's erstwhile advisor, Yi Yin had him imprisoned. Now, the story is that Yi Yin spread a rumor that the kid was trying to uh, divide up the kingdom, and he was going to um, overthrow many of his father's uh, advisors, and that he was going to take absolute control and just all sorts of seditious and treasonous plans were purportedly being concocted in the mind of 
the boy who would be king. So Yi Yin had him locked up. Now, for the next three years, Yi Yin administered the empire. He was as far he was the de facto king, the king in fact. Was he the de jure, the king in law? No, of course not. But he was the king in, in, you know, in fact, he actually did the stuff the king would do and he liked it. Three years later, old boy comes back. He escapes the prison because he's telling, the, what's so funny is he's telling the guards, um, do you know who I am? Nope. I'm Tang Shang. I'm, I'm his son. You're Tang Shang Jr.? No, I'm I'm not, but I'm his son. And they're like, then why are you in prison? And, he t- and they're like, that, that ain't right. And he's like, right? It's not right. If you guys help me, I'll be the king. The king can hand out favors. You help me, I help you. Everybody's happy. So, bottom line is he returns to the capital, returns to the palace, and kills Yi Yin. Live by the sword, die by the sword, yes? Yi Yin took his plowshare and beat it into a sword. And yes, obviously it is his fault. Do not misconstrue or misinterpret what I'm saying, yes, Yi Yin is a, was a murderer. Cold-blooded, calculating, self-serving, vicious, ambitious, all the ishous words, except delicious. He was not delicious. And he, you know, he lived by the sword, he died by the sword, Justice was poetic and justice was served, as far as I'm concerned. The thing that I focus on is Yi Yin was not a murderer by nature. That palace perverted his nature and took a farmer and made him a murderer. Just as we talked about with the Spartans, you know, being insensibly softened to virtue by being surrounded by sights and sounds that promoted virtue. I believe Yi Yin, when he was a farmer, I bet he was such a virtuous guy. He was obviously a good guy. Just as there's evidence of his treachery and his crime, there's evidence of his goodness and his virtue. Now, they do not exculpate him. Fancy Latin word for remove the guilt from. See if you know your Latin. They do not exculpate him, right? From his his guilt of murdering those young men. But in a sort of way, not a literal way, The king's invitation murdered Yi Yin. Yes, he chose to go with the king, but who among us wouldn't? And the lesson, I think, there are so many. And that's why I love the story of Yi Yin. Not not because it's like true crime. You know, there are going to be like people on TikTok like, well, I saw a video of Yi Yin, and he was by his crops, and he was stabbing somebody. You know, there are going to be all them TikTok amateur detectives going to be, 
Well, King Tang Shang, he didn't invite Yi Yin. He he hid in the carriage and ended up. He snuck into the path. Whatever. I really do believe that the palace turned that farmer into a murderer. And guess what? I believe it would have the potential to do likewise to any of us. It is rare, as Aristotle said, rare that someone can ascend to those heights and not have surrendered his virtue. The air, the air up there is is very thin. It does stuff to your brain. You see it all the time. You see it all the time. People become famous and they they become weird. I only want pink M&Ms and the M&M bowl has to be 47.6 degrees. You know what I'm saying? Like the writers for these concerts and stuff. And I guess the lesson I take, and you tell me in the comments if you agree, you disagree, why. What, what... What is the lesson? What do we learn from Yi Yin? I learn to be happy doing what nature, what God meant for me to do. That it wasn't some sort of um, promotion, the invitation to the palace that what did he lack other than wealth and ease and luxury? He had respect. He had love. He had food. He had a farm. He even had respect from the king. I mean, what did, what could the king offer ye? And I mean, the same thing any king would offer any of us, right? You know, Come to the palace, you'll have everything you want. You know, that's the Confucius, right? Be careful of what you wish for, because you might get it. Yi Yin, it's a story that I think about all the time, guys. I'm not kidding. And I knew that this podcast I wanted to do, I wanted to talk about Yi Yin. And I want to talk about the next guy, too. The next guy I want to talk about, it, just a few hundred years after Yi Yin. But let me know, okay? In the con- do you? Because I think, gosh, if Yi Yin had just stayed there, no, we wouldn't know his name. It reminds me of of um, the Iliad, which I'm going to talk a lot about that on this podcast because that is my jam. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember in the Iliad when Achilles' mom comes to him? And she puts it to him like this. Look, two paths in front of you, my son. One, you go home. You be a prosperous farmer. You'll live a long life and nobody will ever know you. A long, happy, forgotten farmer. Or you can stay here at this battle. You can die young. And your name will be repeated for the rest of time. That's what the Yi Yin thing reminds me of. What would you choose? Every year when I teach the Iliad, I bring up Yi Yin. Now, what do you choose? Do you choose to be an, you know, unknown, happy farmer who lives a long life, but, you know, nobody knows who you are and nobody, nobody knows your name 
3,000 years after you lived? Or do you hop on that carriage, go to the palace, and have that place rub off on you, and just hope that it doesn't rub off on you? Hope that you aren't insensibly softened to the ways of the court, to palatial perversions. It is so rare, so rare. And they're 30 years beyond Tang's death. He probably forgot that he was a farmer. I just don't want, and take this metaphorically, don't forget that you're a farmer and that you're a respected farmer and you're good and you're virtuous. Don't forget that. The palace is sometimes just the way station before the prison, okay? Remember Yi Yin. All right, let's talk about the next guy, Wu Ting. Now, if you look him up, his name, I noticed because I wanted to see, like, you know, scholarship, recent scholarship. Most of the time, they spell his name Wu Ding with a D now. Okay, I'm not going to call him Wu Ding, not because I don't think that's probably more correct, because it seems like lots of scholars now say that. But because I've always called him Wu Ting, and if I call him Wu Ding, I think I'll get confused. So here's the deal with Wu Ting. 1200 BC, China. This story has sort of the inverse. How did you guys, how did you guys take a picture of him? Just kind of. Top Gun reference. If that's on your bingo card, you mark that one off. Uh, an 80s reference by Joey. That's on the if you bingo card there. If you got your Joey podcast bingo card, that's an 80s reference. So you can mark that one off. Anywho, it's kind of the inverse of Yi and Wu Ting. So Wu Ting is a prince. His dad realizes that... He doesn't want his son to grow up around a bunch of sycophants and flatterers and just all the sorts of debauchery and deceitfulness that is part of palace life. So his dad sends Wu Ting to live among the poor and the farmers. Now, he's young, so I'm sure Wu Ting was, you know, his dad could, you know, his dad could sell it any way he wanted to. Hey, buddy, you want to go on vacation? Dad, sweet, where are we going? We're going out in the country. We've got Airbnb out in the country. We're going to go just me and you, some father-son time. We're going to head up. We're going to get out to the country. Just get away from it all. Get some fresh country air in our lungs. Maybe, maybe pick something, you know, whatever. Maybe an apple, potato. I don't know. Let's just, I I got all hooked up. Airbnb. Got the, got the code to get in. Me and you, buddy. Let's hit the road. And you know, Wu Ting was like, dang. You know, it's probably like, he's like, when are we leaving, dad? And he's like, in the morning. We're going to leave in the morning, bright and early. What time? I don't know. To get there on time, I think we need to leave here about 4.30. It is 1200 BC after all. I'm, you know, we, we ain't going to Uber. We ain't flying. So I'm thinking we need to leave early. I'm, I'm going to say 4.30, wheels up, 4.30. Got you. Bet. You know Wu Ting would have been awake at like 3.30, like sitting there looking at his dad while his dad's asleep, like, You know, and that's how you can tell it's all about mindset. It's all about the way you 
perceive things, the way you see it, the way uh, what's what you value. Because if someone tells you you got to wake up at six in the morning to go to school, you're like, oh my goodness. And your mom has to drag you out of bed by the foot, bouncing your head on the floor. You know what I'm saying? She's spraying you down with the hose, trying to get you clean because you're a teenager and you smell. You know what I'm saying? And you come to school, you're sitting there, you're like, mm, because you went to bed at 2 a.m. and getting up at 6 for school. But if I told you we got to, tomorrow's Christmas, you know, you know you're going to be awake at 4 saying, what time is the sun supposed to come up? Come on now. You know what I'm saying? What's the difference? One, something you don't want to do. One, something you do want to do. So it ain't getting up early that we don't like. It's getting up early to go to something as painful as school that we don't like. <sighs> a beverage. I'm going to have the same. I actually do have the same cup brought to you by the good people at Dunder Mifflin. The people... Paper, people, people, person. I don't know. I forgot what it says. So Wu Ting. Let's go, buddy. They get out there. Dad's like, hey, why don't you go up and uh, put the coat in while I get the suitcases out of the trunk? Oh, serious? Thanks, Dad. Hey, you know, you're my boy. You're my boy, Blue. You're my boy. So Wu Ting and his dad's like, pshong. Uh, that <laughs> most of that probably didn't happen. Most of that probably didn't happen like that. But Wu Ting was sent by his father to live with the poor and the farmers. That part is true. I know this much. No, I'm. It's a little pitchy for me, dog. It's a little pitchy. With a thrill in my hand. And a pill on my tongue. This open up has just begun. Oh my gosh. No, seriously. Because I know you think, there's some of you out there thinking, this dude is such, he's such a put on. Ask around. Some of my students that follow, that watch my podcast are like, he's not putting on. That's, he's just certifiable. So, Wooting gets left out there with the poor and the farmers because his dad knows like everyone else knows, except apparently Yi Yin, that being out there with the farmers in the land, creating a dependence on deity that the rest of us can only dream of, pray for, is good for his son because he's not going to leave his son out there forever. He just wants to, when his son comes of age, when it's his son's time to ascend the throne, that his son is a good man and a good king. That he is worthy to rule over others. That he's someone that other people would willingly subject themselves to his law because of his virtue because of his wisdom, because of his humility. And his dad knows none of those things are going to insensibly get into him. None of that's going to rub off on him at the palace. Send him with the farmers. So, he does. He, it comes to, he spends his time with the farmer. We know nothing other than he grew up with the farmers. Grew up among the poor. That's just, that was his life. Until it came time, his father passed, was about to pass, and it was time for Wu Ting to ascend the throne, to take the throne, his father's throne. When he got to the palace, he did not speak a word for three years. Now, guys, I, I bet there are those of us who would find it difficult to not say a word for three hours, much less three 
years. Now, is it possible that Sima Qian exaggerated? Sure. Is that the point? No. Wu Ting grew up among the poor, among the farmers. When he returns to the capital to rule as king, he is not the man he would have been had his father not wisely, mercifully, graciously, lovingly sent him out to grow up with the farmers. Now, I don't know why exactly he didn't speak for three years other than what's in the the record. He was stunned. My word, the word C. McKeon, I can't remember. You know, he was, he was mortified by what he saw because he was too young to remember the culture of the capital when he, you know, when he left it. He was sickened by what he saw, by the behavior, by the attitude, by, by the, the fake. And he didn't speak for three years. He couldn't find it within him to speak for three years. Sima Qian says that eventually Wu Ting did speak, but that, and I'm reading this from the ancient record, I just printed it for myself to be able to not have to whoosh, whoosh, whoosh with the book, that after he began speaking again, he only spoke words which were full of harmonious wisdom guys he only spoke words that were full of harmonious wisdom harmonious i think we could we could do with some harmony in the world Wisdom, definitely, we could all definitely take a little, dial it up a little bit on the wisdom and the harmony. It's another unity. But his was harmonious and wise. Harmonious with what? Harmonious with nature. Harmonious with virtue. Harmonious with the law, harmonious with that which was instilled in him by growing up miles and miles and miles from the shadow of the throne. So, words full of harmonious wisdom was Wu Ting. It reminds me, so my dad's side of the family were Quakers when they came over, right? William Penn, the whole shebang. And my first ancestor in America, Charles Wolverton, who settled eventually in New Jersey, he had a Bible when he came over in the 1600s. And in the front of that Bible was written a, a uh, proverb. And it said, Before you speak, make sure that what you're about to say is more profound than the silence it replaces. Before you speak, make sure that what you're about to say is more profound than the silence it replaces. What, what does it say in the Bible? Let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. Whatsoever is 
more than this cometh of evil. Words full of harmonious wisdom. Don't, don't run off at the mouth. Make sure before you say anything that what you're about to say is more profound than the silence it replaces. Because sometimes in that silence is when we hear that, that voice. Imagine how much silence, how much quiet, how much calm and peace Wu Ting possessed because of his father's love. That's a king's love that turned a, a guy who would have grown up with who knows what kind of habit into a virtuous and good king, a king that was beloved. Um, in fact, the last thing that I have is the ancient historian says that Wu Ting maintained peace in his kingdom by not indulging in useless ease, but admirably and tranquilly providing over all his people until all of them, small and great, had no need to murmur. Boom. There you go. Wu Ting. Words full of harmonious wisdom. Right? No useless ease. Admirably, tranquilly presided until all of his subjects, great and small, had no reason to murmur. Words full of harmonious wisdom. How did he get that way? It's my assertion and truly held belief that he got that way because his father, the king, realized what could happen to his son if he allowed his son to marinate in that pestilence of a palace. Yi Yin is known to history as a cold-blooded murderer for exactly the opposite. He left that place that had rubbed off so much good virtue and wisdom on him. He sacrificed all of that for luxury and useless ease and ended up living and dying by the sword. Guys, hope you learned something from these lessons today. Thank you so much for being here, and I'll see you in a couple of days. Bye.